Thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining us. Um, today's um, discussion really is just that, is a discussion. Uh, this is not designed to kind of be a training about augmented. We're going to kind of talk on a more philosophical level about some of these things. And, um, you know, Nick has, has a lot of experience using it already, um, and I have some as well. And so I wanted to, uh, to just kind of warn everybody that you can almost think of this as more like a podcast as opposed to uh, uh, a presentation or something that you need to really focus very much onto the screen. So um, let's talk a little bit about kind of getting yourself ready for for not only for, for augmented, but for 3D in general. Um, you know, I, my, my number one suggestion to people, especially if they're just kind of getting this, is to learn a bunch of 3D programs. SketchUp, I've been using it for a long time, back, you know, all the way from back when it was a, uh, a Google application. It's now part of Trimble, but um, I, I've always been a big fan of it and a nice interface and it's really kind of 3D for the masses. I don't, Nick, do you even use SketchUp? I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm not as much of a SketchUp user. Um, I uh, have tinkered a little bit with it. Um, I, I do most of my 3D drafting in, in Vectorworks actually. Um, sure. But yeah. I, I think your, your point is well made that, you know, regardless of what, um, you know, these all have a really common language and, and getting yourself familiar um, with how software thinks about 3D environments, what some of the vocabulary is, um, those are going to be the kinds of things that translate directly into, into augmented, which is also a 3D environment. Um, I guess I would also say that, you know, the, it's important to learn some of these core concepts. Uh, sort of the, the next thing to talk about, unless there's any big questions about learning 3D programs in the in the first place, is getting what I call getting your venue ready for 3D, and that's you know perhaps a misnomer. It's not really getting your venue ready for 3D so much as learning about your venue and learning how you're going to put that into a 3D environment and what that's going to gain you. Um, you know, and my number one tip, and this is right at the top, is choose your origin. Um, this is kind of the point that you're going to decide where everything else gets measured from, um, not only in terms of creating, and obviously you can change these things throughout, you can move things, but to decide which is the point that will never move. And in a traditional proscenium theater, you know, the center line, plaster line uh, intersection can be a really good choice. A lot of people know where that is. We're going to talk a little bit about center lines <laughs> in a bit, but uh, so I put it in the next comment here to start big and then focusing on the the walls and the even the seats probably those sort of things. Um, I don't know, Nick. Have you have you spent much time drafting any of the spaces you're working in? I'm curious about your thoughts on on that. You know, augmented in particular, as as we've kind of will talk more about, I'm sure interact with right. Um, if you're using a, a feature like point and click to focus, um, you know, it, it may be that you don't need in downtown New York in February with Augmented, um, you know, we had uh, uh, some, some musical instruments on stage. So there was a piano, there was a drum kit, um, things like that. And, and I just put in, you know, uh, basically a floor. Uh, the venue has um, some columns for the band. Decades worth of time drafting all of the detail of your venue do you need it? You know, do you need every seat? Um, so I think that uh, making those choices, uh, how much time commitment you're putting in versus what you're going to get out of them is a big thing to think about as you start to put your, your venue, your space into, um, into any 3D space. Yeah, and I sort of say that as well, you know, focus on the immovable. These are the things that kind of nobody nobody's going to be able to move these things, at least without a huge interaction. Um, so. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, to your point of, of origin as well, you know, origin in the 3d space is the single reference point in, in three dimensional space where everything else is, um, is referenced off of. Right. So your origin is, is really important. And, 
and you know the the number of venues that I've been in where they're supposed to be symmetrical but they're not is is pretty staggering. Um, so uh, you know your your recommendation for a plaster and center line for a proscenium space that's something that a lot of venues already have marked out pretty clearly, especially if um, you know they're a hall that accepts uh, uh, outside productions, tours, things like that. Um, so I think that making sure uh, origin set will allow environments and augmented worthwhile. I, uh, I I kind of laugh because there's I remember learning back in I don't know if it was grade school or high school middle school whenever it was about three four five triangles, and I kind of didn't appreciate at the time that I how many times in my life I would use those, um, and it's certainly. Uh, something that I find when I'm putting together a drafting of a space or things like that, even in the workshop, is using the very basic three, four, five triangle to find what's the right angle from this point. Because sometimes it can be pretty awkward to use um, you know, a square or something like that. So um, another kind of thought that I have is color coding your model. As you're creating it, there's going to be times when you're like, there's a wall, it's kind of over here. Maybe draw that in a different color, just to remind yourself that this isn't its real place. I'm going to come back to that. And the things that you are sure of, the things that are 100% uh, um, accurate and have been measured out, mark those in a different color. That's kind of the way I tend to work. And I, I make a note here about beware error propagation as well. Um, to say, for example, you're measuring out where your make sure you're always kind of go back to uh, that origin point for your kind of base measurement so that you're not propagating errors throughout um, I know I've been there and I've done it there's kind of a the next question I have as well is how many center lines do you have and I I feel like it's if not a hundred percent very nearly a hundred percent of the uh, spaces I've worked in you say where's the center line they go oh well there's a few um, and that's especially a danger, I think, when you're measuring up the space or you know getting ready to, to put it into uh, to augmented, that you choose which one is going to be your center line for your purposes and don't measure the front of house off of one and the stage off of another. So embrace your venue. Yeah, and that's of course. Yeah, to your point, Luke, you know, the, the venues that I've been in as well, and it, construction, you know, it's it's not always down to um, the level of precision that you want. And so there may be a center line that's on the catwalks. There may be a center line that's the actual deck. There may be a, a slightly different center line for the house. Um, so so choosing which one of those you want is, um, is, is really important. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the spaces we're all working in, they might be 100 years old. Um, they might be, uh, you know, have been built on a budget. Maybe uh, I see a lot of venues that were, you know, this is only a one-year place. We're only going to be in here for one year, and then it's going to be blah blah blah, and then cut to 50 years later, and it's still here. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think these these are all important points. Nesting and foldering, and this is getting more into the, the details of augmented, but doing a good job of deciding which pieces and parts that you're putting into a drawing are sort of tied to another one. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we get into um, talking more about augmented itself. But don't overcomplicate things. Really think about, you know, what are the most important aspects of my drawing and focus on those. And that kind of leads into the next statement that remember that creating your venue is an ongoing journey. Um, don't think of it as a destination of like, oh, at some point I'm going to have this done. You have to sort of um, think about what are the most important things. So, and, you know, my last comment here is consider professional scanning. There are companies out there that do this professionally. They have all the right tools. Maybe it's a, a LIDAR tool or um, something like that and they go in and this is what they do all the time and they're going to do it a lot more quickly and a lot more accurately and you know kind of uh, more expensively of course but do consider it and look into it and see consider your time over 
you know, how much is that going to cost in the long run? Yeah, you know, and I, like like I talked about, I, I think that you need to decide what you're going to use. You know, um, if if a floor and uh, the proscenium are all you really need, um, then spend your time doing that. But but as you said, you don't have to you don't have to have every detailed facet for every production. Um, you know, if if you're in a venue where uh, you you reside, you know, you're in that venue all the time. Um, it may be worth putting in details over time, like you said, Luke. Just you know, adding some details here and there uh, as as you get more comfortable with it. Um, but you know, uh, details also mean additional rendering. So what is that going to do to the processing power of whatever machines you're running um, the software on? So consider that as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the kind of the the last thing that we really kind of had to plan to talk about was the idea of getting your workflow ready for 3D. And this is going to be the big change um, that we that we anticipate is there are features in Augmented that will um, either slowly or quickly change your approach to um, not only programming with EOS, but lighting design in general, um, loading in a show and like that. Um, First and foremost on that is this is the time to get involved in the augmented open beta. And I, I put the link up here, etcconnect.com slash augmented. This is you know a, a rare opportunity that a number of people have that maybe they have a little bit more time to work on things than they maybe normally would. And we've got you know a ton of beta testers out there already. Um, but we're always interested in more comments. We're also doing a, a number of uh, webinars on our website. You can see them all under the study hall section. There's one Lowell did, Lowell's the product manager for, uh, for Augmented. And he did a, a webinar last week, which is using, using uh, Augmented in an educational environment. And that went really well. And that really spawned a lot of new ideas and questions and comments that people had about doing yet another uh, online training, kind of a, the idea being, let's start from a napkin sketch of a venue. How do I turn that into an augmented show file? So I think that's going to be an exciting one and keep your eyes open for that. And again, you know, the, the open beta community forums, uh, take a look at community.etcconnect.com. Yeah, and I think, you know, Luke, we've been also in the education side of things. Um, we've been working on getting uh, an educational workbook together. Um, you know, we've been working on getting some training videos, just like we do with all of our other EO series. Um, so, as you mentioned, like this is in beta now, but as we get closer to release, those things will start to be released as well. Um, you know, so that there's a, a full uh, ability to get educated in this. So. Um, I see an interesting comment here from Larry. It says, when creating, is it good to have a base plan so you don't propagate to future shows? I think so. I mean, everybody's going to find their way a little bit, and it's it's sometimes difficult to, to be disciplined enough to say, I'm always going to go back to this base show file and update whatever, you know, I determined that this piece of scenery or this piece of architecture, more importantly, was a little bit off. I'm going to adjust this to be 20 centimeters this way where it really is to remember to not only do that in the show that you're working on, but back in the base show file. But it probably is sort of a, a good practice to do that, or at least to make notes about that. Um, it is pretty easy to to you know, look up the location of things that you may have changed and put them back into a, a base show file. Well, that's a, it's a, an interesting question. I don't know, Nick, you've done a couple yeah. of shows now with this. and. Yeah, unfortunately, um, not, not at the same venue. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but I think there's, there, of course, right? Uh, but but there is a, a, a feature um, that uh, is new with 3.0 that has to do with augmented, that when you open a new show file, uh, you have the ability to retain your model. Um, and so I think that'll be really useful for people that are in the same venue with regularity, is starting a new show file for a new production, uh, you don't have to ditch your architecture, right? Um, so that's something that, that will hopefully ease that a little bit more so you're not having to keep a base show file with just your architecture and re-import it every time. Um, 
But I, I do think that, like you said, Luke, um, being able to, to put in some more detail over time, um, the iterative nature of how these models will probably develop uh, means that, um, you know, you'll, you'll probably want to make changes to that over time anyway. Right. Okay. Um, Janice asks an interesting question. Uh, if you have a good drawing in Vectorworks based on a scan, for example, can you import that directly into uh, Augmented? And the answer, uh, happily, is yes. We have a, a couple of different uh, levels of Vectorworks import, uh, and Vectorworks is not the only one. But bringing in the sort of the base uh, drawing, absolutely, you can do that. You can export from Vectorworks in a number of different formats, and Augmented can read in a number of different formats. Um, I'm not actually sure which is the best one for it. I tend to use OBJ myself uh, for any of this work, but I know that there's uh, Collada files and things like that. But it's it's a pretty simple thing to do that. Now with Vectorworks, we also have an additional level of import, which allows you to bring in not just the sort of geometry of the space, but also bring in the fixtures, the fixture patch, orientation, shutter cuts, all of those things. So that's uh, a Vectorworks plugin. That allows you to do that. Thanks for that question. Yeah, and, and in, um, go ahead, Nick. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, in my experience, um, I've been using the Collada file out of Vectorworks for my models. Um, it, it seems to retain uh, orientation and uh, origin better. Um, so for me, uh, and, and Janice, if you you've got a model of your space. Um, you know, make sure your origin is where you're going to want it um, in your drafting file. And then with a Collada export, you can bring that in, uh, import it as a model, and it will retain all that information. Um, I've had varying success with OBJ files. Um, sometimes they come in at weird scales, and I think that just has to do with file format and what's actually stored with them. So I, I think we'll have recommendations question. for all this. Look it out. Adam asked the question, and I, I probably should have been clear here. He says, does that mean that Augmented can have both a base file and a show file that sits on top of that? And this is just like any other EOS show file. You would keep that as a sort of base EOS show file. Um, uh, it's a new format, ESF 3D. Uh, but that allows you to kind of you know, use that as your place where you're always making your changes um, to infrastructure and things like that. And then you could also bring those changes in to whatever active show file that you're using. So, yeah. Um, you know, on the subject of getting your workflow ready for 3D, the, there's a comment that we often have, you know, isn't this just another pre-visualization pre software? Um, there's a number of those out there. And of course, augmented is great for pre-visualization. But when we when we were sitting down at the very beginning, we said we don't want to just make another visualizer. We really want to focus on making a tool that's going to be continue to be useful once you're in the real space. And um, part of that discussion from a workflow standpoint is who's creating these models of the set. Um, this is perhaps a, a change from um, the way people have worked previously, and more importantly, who updates the models when things change. There's certainly been, you know, the use of doing, creating 3D models for, for example, for a set piece for a long time, but if they make the thing and it's a little bit different or they, you know, go off piece a little bit, we're going to do it this way, well, whose responsibility is it to do a sort of as-built drawing of that to make sure that it's useful um, within augmented. I don't know if you've run into that yet at all, Nick, in any of the shows you've done. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think it, um, uh, it opens up some interesting stuff because, um, you know, are you getting, are you getting drawings from a Phoenix team? Um, uh, and, and, you know, how are those getting converted into what you need to bring into augmented? Um, you know, Phoenix drawings, if they're in 3D, uh, even, you know, they, they're often still in 2D, um, they are generally uh, drafted for detail, right? The shop needs to take those drawings and, and build scenery off of them. Um, so they're kind of a little bit at odds with 
with what we want for our system, which is just sort of representational stuff that we can interact with, right? We don't need all the detail. Um, so in a, in a production team, you know, who's responsible for um, making sure that that model is, is doing its best work for the lighting work now that it needs to do. Um, so I, I think that that's something that depending on uh, the structure of the teams, uh, you know, labor constraints, uh, things like that, you know, we'll, we'll see that as this gets out there and, and more evolved. Um, so, and I also think in, in the same sort of way, you know, and I think we might talk about this in a little bit, but um, who's responsible for providing the architectural uh, model um, and, and ensuring its accuracy? Um, if, if I'm on tour, uh, is that now part of my tech package? You know, do I, do I preload that um, before I even get to the venue? Um, I, I think a lot of this will develop as more people get comfortable with the tool set. Um, uh, I don't, I don't really know that we have a, a, a built-in system for this yet. Um, because it's, yeah, it's it is a, a, a question. Like, is this going to become part of a tech rider? Here's, you know, here's our, our instrument package. Here's what we have. Um, here's the width of the stage. In fact, here's the, the 3D model of the stage. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how that evolves and um, and you know where that evolves. Does it sort of start on the the bigger venues and move down, or is it, is the other way going to be the the more likely scenario? Um, yeah, and I, I also think yeah, and, and from even an internal to a lighting team standpoint, um, you know, in a lot of markets, New York included, um, it's the programmer's job and purview to to deal with everything in the show file. Um, once you're in production. And, and so if there's changes to um, scenic models, if there's changes that need to be made um, to the venue because something's inaccurate, you know, is that, is that something that now the programmer is also responsible for? Um, are they going to have the time for that sort of thing? Uh, is this something where the associate is helping out? You know, they, all, they always have a lot of stuff going on too. Um, you know, how does the, the production electrician deal with this ahead of time? Do they at all? Uh, I think there will be some interesting discussions around uh, the the implementation of the labor of this, and and I think that that will divide up differently, uh, market to market, you know, city to city, country to country. Um, so it'll be interesting yeah, to watch. I think, yeah, that will be interesting to watch. Um, you know, the the same, and, and Nick touched on this a little bit. But the same caution of don't overcomplicate things. You might have drawings from a from a scene shop which include screw placement um, and these sort of details that just aren't going to be interesting. There are ways within drawings usually that you can turn layers on and off before um, importing them. And we're generally speaking going to be looking for the lowest poly, meaning the fewest number of triangles drawing uh, for the best performance. I don't think it's it's panic stations. People aren't going to have to say like, oh, I've got you know 250 triangles in this drawing. I really want to get it down to five, but um, you don't need all of that level of detail. So um, yeah, kind of leads I, into it, a question well, I, that. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I was going to say, I, you know, I received a, a drawing uh, with a with a, a, a back wall um, that was 78 different segments. And it, it needed to be 12, you know, so like those right. things will compound over time if you're not, if you're not careful about it. Mm -hmm. Sean asks an interesting question, which is kind of Sean Riley, uh, a related question on that. He says, as a scenic designer, how can I best support the LD with digital files of my 3D? How should I push updates? And to the first point, I think that the biggest help is to have a, a good clean drawing that does have layers that can be turned off by whomever it is that ends up being the one to do that work to say like, I'm not, um, these are the only aspects of it that I'm interested in before I you know, bring it into augmented. Um, and then how should I push updates? Yeah, that is the, the big question is how, how to manage that sort of the change management aspect of it. And how much do we need to worry about that? It should really, you know, the, as beautiful as our, our model is going to look, the audience is never going to see it. So how should we prioritize what's important and what's not? When should we just make a sort of quick and dirty change to fix something within augmented as opposed to bringing in a brand new model and like that? And those are kind of open questions, I would say. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I think that each team is going to find um, their own necessity to that. And and to your point, Luke, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a tool for the lighting team. It's you know, we don't we don't care how pretty it is as long as it's functional and getting us what we need to get it uh, done. Um, so I think there's going to be uh, a lot of workflow. The, the other thing that I'll say is that, um, you know, sort of back to uh, your, your, your polyline. Um, in drafting in 3D, it's, it's really easy now to go online and, and just sort of search for uh, a, a, an object, right? And to say, I need an end table, I need a Victorian chair, uh, I need a drum kit, uh, you know, and, and pull those things down and just pop them into your model uh, for, for scenic rendering. Um, the difficulty with a lot of those is they tend to be very complex drawings, right? Again, they're very detail oriented. Um, and for a lot of other industries that are using these models, that's really important. Um, for us, again, we're always keeping an eye on performance because at the end of the day, your light board is still, you know, a light board. Um, so it's trying to concentrate on getting levels to the rig and uh, calculating fade times and effects and things like that. So the more stress that you're putting on the processor to render graphics, um, the more of that uh, gets difficult and you, you might start to see some, some issues with display performance. Um, so finding models or using representational objects, again, do I need it to be a drum kit with all of these polylines? or will a rectangle of generally the same shape uh, and space do what I need to do when I'm doing something like point to click or when I'm trying to look at, uh, you know, through point of view to, to find it through the point of view of the fixture. Um, you know, I, I think we're gonna wanna keep a close eye on assets that we get from the internet uh, because of all of that and, and just make sure we're using ones that uh, are as low, uh, as low difficulty on the processing power as, as, as we can get. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of questions. One is from Stan K. Um, I'm assuming this is our Lumen brother, Stan K. Hey, Stan. Um, can I get a beta version now to explore it? Absolutely. If you go to etcconnect.com slash augmented, it is now in open beta. And this is a, a great time for all of us to do that, to, to start getting involved in that um, open beta community. It's, it's, proven to be very stable already. Um, obviously, there's still some features going in. There's still a lot of work um, going on, but it's, it is being used on shows. It is being um, you know, explored, and we're getting a ton of great feedback. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, take a look at that. And if you have any problems, get in touch uh, with us. Uh, we actually have an email address augmented at etcconnect.com should you have any you know, problems like that, or even if you just have ideas for cool features and uh, feel free to get in touch or put them on the forums. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of those uh, features uh, of Augmented. Uh, first one that I think is gonna be really a, a game changer is fixture position estimation, or FPE. What this means is, you know, the sort of elevator pitch on this is, you put your light in the air and then you put four markers on the ground and uh, the model actually when you put a new model in to augment it automatically does this you just have to know where those are and more importantly the computer has to know where those are you then point the lights all of the lights at those assuming these are moving lights of course um, you point them at those four to eight different positions um, some people use a gobo, like a target gobo or something like that. And then you run the FBE and it says, okay, well, if, if the pan and tilt information is what it is for these four points, the light therefore must be run it through a calculation here, which saves you a lot of the, the time and hassle of having to go in and measure exactly uh, where it is. And Alex Lynn, hey, Alex, asked the question, looking to the future, once you've built up a collection of models for a touring show, do you see augmented being able to handle auto updates of positions, reducing programming times? And I think that a lot of that technology is kind of there, maybe not exposed quite yet, but the ability to say, well, if I know how to get here, here, and here, clearly I know how to get over here because it's only mathematics. So I do see that that is uh, kind of where things will be headed. Nick, yeah, and I, I've, um... on the shows that you've done? 
Yeah, yeah, I've done um, I've done FPE in a couple of venues of various sizes, um, and we also did some some FPE um, for some of our, our our video shoots and things uh, out at our factory um, in in Middleton, Wisconsin. Um, you know, I think that <laughs> you kind of I, I like that you were like, well, it's just mathematics, and um, you know, that, <laughs> yeah. that is, hopefully, that there's no real engineers there. listening, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Like I, I majored in theater, so I, I, uh, you know, I, I majored in feelings, not in math. Um, so, you know, I think that um, the the trouble that I had uh, is was was me introducing human error in this, right? You know, it is math, um, and and math has to be accurate. And so, um, you know, you you mentioned it sort of earlier in the presentation, but like. Uh, Two electricians and a roll of spike tape and uh, and a tape measure. You know, if I'm trying to lay out a, a square on the stage to match my FPE points in my model, so that this math can work. Um, you know, how do I how do I easily ensure that I'm actually getting a square and not getting a parallelogram? Um, we had to retape a couple times just from the sheer uh, human error that we were introducing. Um, so I think that these these tools make things fast, but you know you have to be accurate, and and I think that that's going to be something that we'll see as people really start to adopt this in their space, um, is is spending the time to be precise, um, because once you you know put in that time on the front end, you're good to go, and and I can I can picture a world where um, you know like touring halls, uh, for example, um, you know if you're on a, a touring show. Uh, a lot of shows uh, that tour uh, everything upstage of the proscenium is, is the same regardless of the venue. So um, they could very easily build things in that are, that are, you know, permanently the same spacing. So this piece of scenery to this piece of scenery to this piece of scenery is always going to be the same spacing. I can use those as FPEs in my tool uh, uh, to, to calculate this stuff um, venue to venue. Uh, you know, if you are a touring house, if you're a receiving house, it may be that you have, in addition to uh, knowing exactly where your uh, plaster line and your center line are, uh, you may now know exactly where these FPE points are. You know, we, we've measured them, we've marked them somehow uh, on our deck, and any, any show that comes in, we can say, put these measurements into your model, and then you can FPE off of them. So again, I think it'll, it'll be different venue to venue in how people work. Um, but it was certainly a challenge just because we were trying to be quick and dirty and get it done fast. Um, we introduced errors and then the math was, was accurate off of wrong data. Um, so there's going to be a lot of learning to, you know, you said the three, four, five triangle to get a perfect right, right angle. Um, those sorts of tools are going to be key in making sure that, um, that we get accuracy so that these, these tools work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Warren asked an interesting question. Hey, Warren, should I orientate my fixtures using FPE before or after I do things like invert, pan tilt, or shutter order changes? Um, I would say before. I mean, one of the interesting things is FPE actually, one of the jobs that it makes easier is for it to figure out which way the fixture is actually pointing, the tails of the fixture are pointing, because it um, pointing at these four to eight positions, however number there are, and um, can work out, okay, well, clearly it must be oriented this way. Um, so I feel like you'd want to do that before you invert your pan and do your shutter order changes personally. I don't know, Nick, do you have any kind of insight on that? Yeah, you know, the, the software, and it's been getting better. Uh, when we first were doing some alpha testing, um, this stuff didn't work, uh, but but the software is taking things like inverted pan and tilt uh, in patch into consideration, and it, it still should uh, recognize the proper orientation of the fixture, knowing that those things have been overrided. I think where you'll get into a position where you don't have a choice is going into someone else's venue and maybe someone else's base show file, right? So if someone has already made the choice that they want to invert pan and tilt, um, for control purposes, right? When I spin my wheel right, I want the light to move right, regardless of the orientation of it. Um, that, that, you know, that may not be a choice that you have. And, and the software 
um, is, is taking into account that those settings are on and should be able to figure it out. Um, I'm sure, again, you know, once this gets into uh, uh, everybody's hands, once we release, that we'll find a lot of stuff with fixtures that, um, you know, maybe there's some bad information in the profile. Uh, you know, that's, that's going to be the nature of some of this. Um, there are some overrides and patch that you can go in and, and edit some of this stuff so that if you do have some issues with the profile, you can correct it. Um, but all in all, I think that um, you may not have the choice and uh, FPE and those sorts of tools should be able to compensate for that and, and understand that those tools are being used. Yeah, sure. Uh, another feature, and this is one that I think is just, if nothing else, it's just really cool, which is fixture POV mode. The kind of basic idea here is that when you select um, a light, a moving light, for example, that doesn't have to be, the model actually moves so that the camera is inside the gate of whatever fixture you just focus. So you're essentially looking at it like it's a follow spot at this point. And it allows you to do some, some really interesting things about focusing a light in an area that you can't normally see. Um, let's, you know, it, a really gross example perhaps, but you are being asked to focus the light uh, as a cross stage wash going into the wings. Well, from where you are in a tech position, you can't see that, but well, you know, your model is correct and you've, you've proven that the light is pointing in the right place. Well, it's now easy to go in and use that fixture POV mode to give you a different view of the stage than you would normally have. So I think that's pretty exciting um, and has a lot of potential for, for saving time in, uh, in programming. People spend a lot of time on pen and tilt encoders and this might eliminate a lot of that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that I actually used it for that I wasn't expecting, um, you know, in, in the theoretical standpoint, I, I always use the example of like, oh, well, this will be useful when um, I'm, I'm roughing in my show. We don't have actors on stage. You know, I'm just trying to get some cues in to the board. Um, and I've got a, an actor that's standing upstage at the couch and I just need to get them in, in some light. And so I'm going to use that fixture point of view to kind of drive that light so I can see where I'm shooting. Um, and I kind of used it that way, uh, in, in a recent show. Um, but I, I was using it for my, I um, and it was because of uh, some of the more saturated colors that had been dropped into the fixture. Um, they were just kind of harder to see. And rather than popping over into a highlight mode um, to do a, a quick touch up, I was able to pop on fixture point of view. And, and like you said, the follow spot analogy is, is perfect. Um, I was able to just sort of see where it was going from the fixture's point of view um, and understand uh, where I was in relationship to the masking that was downstage of it uh, and, and sort of, you know, how much, how much my zoom was going to cover uh, the, the area of light. So it's really, really useful to just be able to, to see the beam from a different point of view that the, you know, my point of view from front of house wasn't allowing me just because of the composition at that moment. So that was kind of exciting to, to be able to play with. Yeah, and I think especially in, in blind mode, it's interesting because you're now potentially looking at something on stage which is different than what's really on stage and being able to, to use that POV mode um, in that way. I think that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a really interesting change to the workflow. Similarly, I feel like stick beams uh, and related to that focus handles are are going to be a, a different way to work. You're going to spend a lot less time spinning encoders and a lot more time focusing on what it is that you really want. Um, just for those who maybe haven't played with it yet, stick beams is a feature that kind of draws a line from the center of the lens of the fixture um, through to where it's intersecting with an object. And the cool thing about that is it allows you to very quickly see, especially in a wash light in the example that Nick was talking about, see where the center of the beam actually is. But even when the light is off, you can see that information. So that's in, in the case of both yeah, beams I, and focus handles, um, it's going to be an interesting change to the workflow. Yeah, one of the shows that I did was kind of more on a, a busking uh, style um, and, you know, sort of, sort of live to air as it were. Um, and, and stick beams were really, really useful for that because I could see, uh, fixtures that were off, um, 
grab them, move them somewhere else, uh, you know, change any color that I needed, and then and then bring them up. And I was confident uh, that they were going to be where I pointed them, right? Uh, if I didn't have a focus palette already in a location and I wanted that light to be there, um, it was an amazing way to be able to, to see what those lights were doing um, and be confident that when I brought them up, they were where I wanted and how I wanted them. So that was that was really, really useful. Yeah, and I think the, the focus handles as an extension of that are a really interesting concept to be able to say, I want to, instead of grabbing the light and moving it, I want to grab what the light is doing on the floor or on whatever object it is and move it and move all of its friends. So if I've created this nice wash look, but I just want to move it all kind of a little bit upstage, downstage, left, right, whatever the case might be, to just kind of grab it more as a concept, more as a, I want to grab this pool and move it over here. And whatever all these lights are doing, they're all going to do the same thing. Um, so I think that's going to be a, an interesting thing to see how people use that. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I thought I was going to love the, the spacing part of focus handles on a real production. You know, when you grab one focus handle, if you've got multiple lights selected, they keep their spacing. So you can do something like, a half circle with you know five movers or something, and and they'll keep their position. Um, but in the actual production, uh, I was really surprised in that the the thing about focus handles is that they they track object surfaces. So as you move them, it understands when the beam is colliding with the side of something or something that's higher than the deck. So when I first tried using them, dragging them, expecting them to kind of go on the plane of the floor, uh, it was. I was getting frustrated with the results and, and realizing that they were tracking the surfaces of the objects as the beam collided with them. Um, I was able to do things uh, like quickly drag them up uh, a staircase um, and get them to, to maintain where I wanted. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the fact that they sort of track those surfaces once my brain got into that was really, really useful and, and made things a little bit faster because now I was using the model uh, to inform my light where to go, which was great. Yeah, and that's you know that's a good example of, of exactly what we talk about when we talk about it being a 3D programming tool as opposed to a visualizer. It's not just showing you what it's doing; it's showing you what you can do, and it's assisting you in doing it. So, yeah, blind mode. Obviously, I think blind and preview are are going to be an interesting change to the workflow as well. We've had preview mode, obviously, in EOS for and blind mode, of course, for a, a long time, but they've primarily been number driven. You, you look at blind and you can see what palette you're in, you can see what the levels are, you can see the tracking throughout queues, but it doesn't really show you what it's going to look like. You are always having to go to live if you wanted to see it. Well, now that kind of changes. We can go in to blind and see what does this queue look like in this scene, even though that's not what's up on stage right now, that's not the set that's on stage, and um, how does this effect play? So that's that's going to be a big game changer, I think, as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's people that have been programmers for a long time. You know, you can kind of, in blind, you sort of look through the numbers, and it's, it's like reading tea leaves, right? You know, there's, there's a little bit of... Uh, uh, trying to visualize what the numbers are doing and, and based on your experience and, and the show, you know, that, that perception of that uh, data can, can be accurate or inaccurate. Um, so I think that, that allowing you to sort of step through cues and blind um, is going to be useful uh, to, to give you a real visual sense, but also to sort of see what's coming. You know, we've all done shows where we're like uh, running by the seat of our pants and, and you know, we're writing three cues ahead of where the show is. Um, in blind with point to click and the ability to see color and texture, um, you know, again, they're, they're gestural views, but they really will give you a sense of what's going on so that you can pop in and, and be programming in a visual space, um, which is something that EOS uh, hasn't had without the assistance of an external visualizer. Um, so, so that's really exciting and I think we'll get a lot of use. Um, I certainly found it very useful on, on shows. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the app and focus wand within the app as well. Um, this is just a, an upgrade to the existing uh, IRFR, ARFR apps, but any device 
it's called a phone that supports um, AR, Core or AR Kit, which are the two technologies behind this, um, now have a new option, which is Focus One. And you know, one of the, the neat aspects to this is that you can act essentially like a laser pointer. You first go up and you calibrate the phone to the real world. There are these AR targets that you can put wherever, um, on the floor, on a wall, on the back of the set piece, whatever you want. And that is basically making the connection between where your device is, where your phone is, and the real world. And it's kind of tying those two together. And once you've done that, you can have multiple of these, but once you've done that, you can now use your phone as if it were a laser pointer and move lights around um, the set. You can set a, an offset, kind of a height, a focus height. So you can say, um, I don't want to just move it here. I want to move it, uh, you know, 180 centimeters above this height so that it's going to inter intersect with the actor or whatever the, the case might be. And it has an inverse to that, which is find me mode, which does exactly that. You push the button and the, the model knows where the phone is and it finds you or finds where the phone is more to the point and focuses the light there. And this allows somebody to go in um, and quickly, you know, I see this being used a lot in the future where you can rough out some focus positions on the stage, drop a, a palette there, drop a, a position reference there and say, I'm going to want lights here. I can wander over here. Okay, I'm going to want some lights here. And the really cool thing is you don't even have to have the lights up and working yet for that to work. You can do it all sort of virtually during the hang, for example. Yeah, I did found you those, the, you know, the reference. the app much, Nick? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, you know, the the things that I found the most useful um, uh, for the show that I used them on, which was um, a, a quick in, you know, we, we loaded in a, a big moving light rig in, in a day, um, uh, was was dropping uh, reference points in, in space, you know. So the app allows you, uh, just like you said, like you can set up your AR target, and once your AR target is uh, is found by the the camera on your phone, um, you know the software knows where you are in the model. And so without any fixtures in space, I hadn't I hadn't done FPE yet to to find my fixtures. They were still hanging them. In fact, um, I was able to go in and say, oh, you know, me and the the designer from uh, the scenic designer were able to be like, okay, well this is where this thing is going, and this is where this person's going to stand. Um, and I was able to just drop those references into the model so that when I got up to the uh, console again, I was able to start converting those into, into focus palettes. Um, so that was a really useful tool. Um, the other thing that was super useful uh, was we were troubleshooting some fixtures and, um, you know, being able to use uh, the, the camera to look through uh, and, and see a channel and see what, what channel number it was. So we were really easy. It was easy to, to look through the camera up at the rig and say, oh, that's channel 72. We need to address that fixture or um, we need to make sure. some changes yeah. to it. So, so that was, it, it, you know, it didn't do anything that we haven't already been doing as a part of our process. It just made it faster and allowed me to do work without the rig uh, being there, which is something that, you know, in sort of these one-off, almost corporate style events, like, you know, you usually can't get to work. You kind of sit around in the morning and make sure your email's checked and your, you know, clock's up to date and everything. Um, this this allowed me to actually get some things into the system that made me faster later, which was huge. I, uh, I want to get to some of these questions. There's, um, as we would expect, a ton of them coming in. Um, uh, Brendan asks, as this becomes uh, more integrated into the programming and design process, how do you see it influencing the design or layout of the next generation of consoles? Um, well, that's a loaded question. Uh, I guess I would say that, the, and this is kind of related to uh, some of the other questions that I've seen, where can you use a second computer? Um, and Warren asked, how does uh, you know, the complexity of the model impact the, the processing of the console? you can absolutely run augmented in a few different ways. And one is that it can be running just on the console, uh, depending on the, the vintage of the consoles. Not all of them can do it. 
but any console that can run 3.0, which is any Windows 7 uh, machine, uh, can run it. And there's a tethered mode, which allows you to kind of run augmented on a separate machine. And that separate machine, a lot of people, I think, would find you want it to have a pretty good graphics performance. That's going to be one of the big advantages there. You know, a gaming computer, essentially, an Alienware or in, name any of the other ones. And that allows you to to kind of not have to worry about the processor or the console being the, the device that's running all these calculations mm -hmm. in terms of 3D. It's completely seamless. Um, any changes that you make on one side are happening on both sides and like that, because it is just a client um, mode, essentially. Um, and as this becomes more integrated in the programming design process, I think that if we were working on a next generation of consoles, we would absolutely be looking a lot at graphics performance and um, interaction. Good question. Thanks, Brennan. Um, some other ones coming in here. Uh, is the show file back compatible? I believe it is. I believe that you can program a show in 3.0 and then run it on 2.9, um, but I might be wrong about that. I, I haven't actually done it. and. I think a lot of people have found that 3.0, even the beta, is so stable that they don't really even feel the need to do that. One of the neat things, though, is that you can dual install both the current version 2.9.1 and 3.0 on the same console, and you can just choose which one you want to run on that console. So. Yeah, Luke, and I'll say, um, so as you mentioned earlier, there's a, we introduced a new file format uh, in order to include all the model information. Um, it is the ESF3D, which is an ESO file with 3D components. Uh, when you get into the beta uh, or when it's released and you're playing with it, you'll notice that there are a couple of save options now. So 2.9 and below won't understand what a .ESF3D file is, but you'll always be able to save a .ESF or a .ESF2, um, which are two other file formats. So those are um, always options. Uh, obviously, they ditch the model when, when you're doing that, um, but you can bring all that information in and all of the features that were available to you in 2.9 will play back just fine with a .esf or .esf2. Uh, Alex asked the question, you mentioned the fixture profiles. Are these being supplied by a common library or specific? These are part of the EOS 3.0 library. So this is the EOS library, the, the latest version of it um, contains um, you know, a growing number of fixtures that are completely sort of characterized in 3D. Uh, James asked the question, the unanswerable question, when is the final release date? Uh, Beta is going really well. We've been getting a ton of good feedback. Um, I don't have any intel at this point. You know, I guess I would say that uh, nobody knows it yet, but the team is hard at work. I think we're still, um, you know, looking at having it for this summer. But I would also say that to a large degree, if you're comfortable running a show on the beta, you shouldn't shy away from it. This isn't going to be official advice to say, oh, yeah, run the beta, it will be fine. But we have not had uh, a great deal of reports of people having any you know, major show stopping problems as a result of this beta. And there's you know, a, a bunch of other kind of good stuff outside of Augmented also built into uh, 3.0. Steven asks an interesting question. Is there any advantage of using the new iPad uh, Pro with LiDAR for use with augmented? Um, I guess what I can say is when that announcement was made, there was uh, a lot of uh, chatter amongst the developers about how cool this new iPad Pro with LiDAR is. So I shouldn't be too surprised to see uh, some stuff going in for that. Uh, Um, Nick, this is Ellen. Do you want to go over that question again about um, the imports, such as uh, WYSIWYG, Capture, Light Converse, Martin Show Designer, Grand MA, AutoCAD? Sure. That, sure, um, absolutely. That Augmented will support. Augmented has a, the ability to import a huge number of 3D file formats, um, and I don't have the list in front of me, but there's almost always a way to get from one 3D program to another through one of these interchange formats. So any program that supports an export in 
any of those formats, um, it really shouldn't be a problem to get data in there. The, the thing that we have with the Vectorworks um, at this point, the, the Vectorworks plugin, is that it takes not just the three-dimensional data of the venue and like that, the set pieces, whatever the case might be, but it also contains all of the fixture data, the patch, the hanging positions, the orientation, the shutter cuts, the gobos, um, gel colors, and things like that. So that is the only, at this point, the only sort of, I'll call it advanced um, import that we have. But of course, um, the road ahead is, uh, is a, is a full road of ideas and of, uh, so we'll see where that goes and what's next. I hope that kind of answers the question. Yeah, and what about, you know, moving scenery, moving truss, um, things like that? Yeah, uh, one of the, the neat things that we have is essentially any group of objects within Augmented can be tied to a desk channel. Um, a special type of dust channel. So that means that you can actually um, move it. Um, Nick, I don't know if you've used any of that in the shows that you were doing. Yeah, actually, um, uh, the, it, it, it's, it's cool because, you know, not only do you have the ability to move scenery, um, so, you know, if you have different themes, um, you can just put on stage uh, what, is, what is useful. Um, but you also have um, uh, the ability to, to move, uh, you know, positions. So um, a, a truss or a batten that has fixtures on it, um, as you move that pipe, um, you know, the fixture obviously moves with it if it's, if it's nested underneath it um, in your augmented model. And, uh, and then we can calculate new positions off of that. So, um, Again, going venue to venue, it's a really useful tool. Uh, you know, I hang my front of house truss with whatever my rig is that, that's on the truck. It rolls out of the truck, and my front of house points are, you know, three meters higher and five meters further back than they were in the last city. Cool. Uh, just update that in the, in the model for those positions uh, or change it on the desk channel, and, um, and you're up and going. Uh, Sort of the other side of that is that um, we uh, allow for uh, XYZ focus palettes now as a part of this. So those will be very useful with fixtures that you expect to be moving, right? So if I've got a, a downstage right position, um, I can record that as an XYZ focus palette, which will store the location in space. And then regardless of where the fixtures end up, uh, they will point at that location. Um, so that's a, a really great way to prep yourself for um, changing conditions in your rig. Um, so some of the people have asked questions about uh, either using sort of odd Chinese moving lights or creating their own, using their own fixtures. Um, how do they deal with that if they're not, fixtures that are already in your library? Um, I mean, the short answer on that is that if you can patch it in EOS, you can use it. Uh, it's going to be a question of how well it will work with a, the, the sort of 3D information within augmented. Um, there are certainly plans to be able to have a, the ability to kind of create your own, put in your own information um, by calculating the information yourself. I can say that it's not always easy to know that information. Um, it's difficult for you know, a, the average person to measure what is the actual um, pan and tilt degrees that this picture can do, what is the actual focal distance, what is the actual um, you know, pivot point distance between this point and this point. So it does become somewhat difficult to do that, but certainly roughing some of it in, you, you, you can or will be able to do. And we expect that that library will continue to grow like every library does, that we will get more and more data in there um, over time. Okay. Um, I don't know if you answered this one yet or not. Uh, Ryan asked if the Vectorworks plugin removes the need for the Lightright import that people currently use. Yeah, um, I guess my answer would be not if you're using Lightright. Um, obviously, if that's your, your, your package that you're using to 
to create your paperwork in the first place, then that's still going to be the best tool for it. If you're using Vectorworks, um, then the Vectorworks plugin, and it might be a combination of the two. Um, there are certainly a lot of people that use both of those, use uh, Vectorworks for drawing and Lightwrite for paperwork management, and uh, they're both valid tools. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, uh, with our Vectorworks plugin, the fields that we're bringing over uh, from Vectorworks into EOS are, are fields that we care about to properly represent those fixtures and visualize those fixtures and control those fixtures, right? So we care about, like Luke said, color and um, profile information and patch and things like that. Uh, Lightrite has a ton of other useful information that is needed to get a show up and going um, that that we're not carrying over through Vectorworks, right? So I, I almost picture that, you know, for a sort of traditional theater process, um, you know, there's a little triangle of software where um, EOS Lightrite and, and Vectorworks are all uh, sharing uh, a, a similar database and, um, you know, each is, is able to access and use that information in a way that suits that tool, right? So as Luke said, you know, uh, Lightrite as kind of a spreadsheet, you know, you can do a lot of mass edits and changes and, and generate labels and, and all sorts of other neat stuff. Um, Vectorworks is a really powerful drafting program. Uh, augmented is tied directly into the core of EOS. So I think for sort of the foreseeable future, um, each of those software platforms has uh, their strengths and, um, you know, but them exploiting all the same data under the hood is going to be a, a good thing so that, you know, ideally we kind of get rid of uh, changes and, and errors um, not making their way into the other systems. Okay. All right. Let's take one more question live here, which is can uh, augmented use GT, GDTF or MVR? Um. I don't believe that we have uh, a GDTF import at this point. I know it's certainly being looked at, and as that, that that's a pretty new uh, format. And um, as obviously with with the the plugin with Vectorworks, we have a lot of exposure to that. Um, I don't believe that we have a native GDTF reader at this point. Nick, do you know? Uh, I don't think we're bringing in GDTF natively, no. So I, I think that that would be yeah. something that, if, again, if you're using something like the Vectorworks plugin, it would it would help you translate that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, there were a lot of questions that came in, and if we didn't get to all of them today, we will try to get back to everyone or maybe post them someplace uh, where people can uh, look up the answers um, afterwards. Yeah, and, and, and what I would um, say is, Sorry to interrupt, Ellen. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and I believe Stan asked for uh, the link again, if you go to our community forums at community.etcconnect.com, that's where we do all of the open beta feedback and downloads and questions and answers. So that's going to be a great place to ask questions because there's a ton of beta users already out there with a lot of ex experience with this, as well as developers and like that. So, yep. Great. Well, a huge thanks to Luke and Nick for today. I think it was really a great discussion, and it was really wonderful of you to take the time to share all this information about Augmented with everyone. Uh, clearly an exciting new development um, in the EOS family. And I'd like to thank uh, ETC again for sponsoring this wonderful live discussion and remind everyone that our webcast remain online um, at www.livedesignonline.com for you and for new viewers to tune in throughout the next year. In the meantime, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks.